The year is 1973 and you want to exhibit conspicuous consumption to all those around you and select a new automobile for your garage that undoubtedly screams you have lots of money. Your choices really at this point, at least from the domestic automakers, would include offering some Cadillac, Lincoln, and Imperial. But seeking the longest production non-limousine vehicle ever made, you decide to select the 1973 Imperial LeBaron and add it to your fleet. Yes, that's right. The 1973 Imperial LeBaron was the longest vehicle that was ever produced by a domestic automaker in non-limousine form. It rode atop a 127-inch wheelbase, which, by the way, was not the longest wheelbase of all production cars, but it measured 235.3 inches in overall length. That's less than 5 inches shy of 20 feet long. Now, by this point, the Imperial had lost a little bit of its luster that it had back in its original days when Imperial had its own assembly line. And Imperial had, by this point, also lost its unique body-on-frame structure that occurred after the 1966 model year when Chrysler moved all Imperials to being unibody like other Chryslers. When introduced for 1969, the Imperial also had to share a fair amount of sheet metal with the more lowly Chryslers. And so Imperial was becoming less and less of its own unique mark and more and more homogenized with Chryslers, largely because the division just didn't sell in enough volume to justify the additional expense of making it more unique than really it was in this fuselage era. And 1973 would represent the last of the fuselage era Imperials. I think an overall handsome design, but for the super chunky bumper guards that were added in 1973 so that the Imperial could meet 5 mile an hour federal impact standards in the front and 2.5 mile per hour impact standards in the rear. It was pretty easy to remove them and a number of individuals did because the car simply looked a lot better and you took off about 5 inches in length by doing so as well. The 73 really represented a warmed over styling from the 1972 models and there weren't all that many changes for that model year. The car was built after January of 1973. It included steel beams in the doors. This was due to federal regulations associated with side impact standards. The cars also had a more finely textured grill than the 1972s. And bumpers were pulled out a bit further than on the 1972s away from the body. And those bumper guards added it because of, as I mentioned, the federally mandated impact standards. There are a few other minor changes for the 1973 model year. Out back, the taillights no longer had that very thin vertical bar in the middle of them that I think gave them a fair amount of character and made them quite attractive. The instrument panel also got a new faux airsats wood grain that was patterned after rosewood. Interiors just changed slightly. The leather pattern that was modeled off of the Barcelona chair was really similar to the 1972 version, but a new fabric was added for 1973, and probably in a name that is not soon to return, Iraq cloth. Yes, that's what it was called. There are a few new options as well for 1973 that you could get on your Imperial. You could get a optional safeguard sentinel automatic turn on and off headlamps, you could also get a new security alarm system, and vehicles came standard with a chronometer, basically an electric digital clock that was guaranteed to be accurate to something around one or two minutes every month. The 1972 Imperials were quite quiet, and that was unique for Chryslers during this time period because even if you got a New Yorker or a New Yorker Brome, these fuselage-era Chryslers were relatively noisy on the inside when driving them over any type of pavement. The Imperials, though, employed much more sound deadening than the Chryslers, and at least the ones that I've driven, I've never noticed them to be noisy on the inside. But for 73, even more sound insulation was added to the vehicle and employed to try to give it a quieter ride, and I believe there are some refinements even to the exhaust system. And, of course, Imperials had quite a bit of optional equipment that was carryover, one element of which was this auto two temp system that you see there at the top. Yes, these vehicles could be equipped with automatic temperature control. This was Chrysler's second attempt, hence the auto temp two, 
And it was a beautifully simplistic system where everything was effectively contained in a box under the hood. And if that box failed, then you just replace it, kind of swap it out, take out four different coolant hoses, two in, two out, disconnect some vacuum hoses, and that's about it. And you swap a new control head in. By the way, Chrysler sold this AutoTemp 2 system to a number of external companies, including Mercedes. So you can find it in a number of other vehicles outside of Imperials. By the way, this car also has an 8-track tape player. And that wheel that you see above the radio, kind of on the top of the instrument panel, that is a speaker fader control to control the sound and how much is coming out of the front speakers versus the back speakers. Another feature that you could get on your Imperial that no one else really offered in passenger cars, aside from wagons and Suburbans and vans and things like that, was rear air conditioning or rear seat heat. You could select from either one. This particular vehicle has rear air conditioning, and that put a separate air conditioning system in the trunk of the vehicle, and there were two vent outlets on the package shelf that then would expel freezing cold air when this toggle switch was pushed either low or high. You couldn't regulate the outlet temperature of that rear air conditioning system like you could the front system because there was no heater core back there and there was no blend door as a consequence where the air could blend the frigid cold air over top of the heater core and mix it appropriately. So there was just this low and high speed fan blowing out freezing cold air. Many Imperials were not equipped this way and as a consequence it's hard to find photos of this rear air conditioning system but here you have one and take a look at the package shelf, you'll see the two outlet vents. Those could be rotated forward and up toward the rear seat passenger. So if you wanted it to be absolutely freezing cold in your Imperial, you basically switch on the rear seat air conditioner as well as the front air conditioner, and you'd be freezing cold in about five seconds. Another cool option on these Imperials and Chrysler products of the area was this dictation setup down here where you can see there was a plug for a microphone and it, you could record your voice and take dictation that you could later give your administrative assistant or back then a secretary to type out. So they were thinking of quite a few different things at Chrysler. I don't think any other domestic vehicle offered a kind of dictation machine like this. And while the rear seats were certainly spacious in both Cadillac and Lincoln, only Imperial offered a head pillow you can see there in the C pillar so that you could rest your head in a nicely integrated reading light there in the rear window glass trim, as well as a so-called lavalier strap next to the head pillow that assisted you when you wanted to exit your Imperial. Also take a look at the door handle and you'll notice that there's a pocket on the rearmost portion of that door handle. You can lift the flap open there and a storage compartment is revealed underneath it. Chrysler typically had an older clientele than the other big three automakers, and maybe that's the reason why in this Imperial and Chrysler's of the era, despite this vehicle having air conditioning and automatic climate control at that, they still had these vent poles where you could open up vents in the lower kick wells. Those were normally eliminated on air conditioning equipped cars by the 1970s for the other automakers. In fact, Ford would use one of the kick well vent areas for its recirculation door for the air conditioning setup so you could not get those kick well vents on really any other domestic vehicles outside of chrysler when you bought air conditioning at least i should say that's true for the full-size automobiles unfortunately by this point the imperials had chrysler's 440 under hood and i believe 1973 was the first year that they no longer used some forge components in the 440s got cheapened to cast iron crank and rods and things like that, I believe. And the engine made 208 horsepower and 340 pound-feet of torque. So it wasn't all that great. did still have a fair amount of torque, but certainly wasn't going to pop your toupee off if you stood on the gas pedal. But if it did, it would land softly in the back seat. Notice here that black box near the firewall and just underneath the brace in the engine compartment. That is the AutoTemp 2 system box that I was talking about earlier. Also notice the Chrysler AirTemp V-Twin air conditioning compressor up front 
a great, stout, reliable air conditioning system on these vehicles that delivered extremely cold air conditioning, no matter what the temperature was outside. Also, take a gander at the firewall, and you'll see a metal module on the passenger side there. That's the electronic ignition module. And if you want to impress your Mopar friends, check to see if there's some residue underneath those modules on the firewall. It often drips on the heater core case there. It's one of the ways that you can tell your electronic ignition is going bad. Also notice inboard of that, more toward the driver's side, there's this white rectangular thing on the firewall. That is the Chrysler ballast resistor, the infamous ballast resistor that would tend to fail, particularly on wet days or if you went to the car wash. And those, thankfully, are very easy to change out. I highly recommend if you're a Mopar lover, just keep a spare one in your glove box. I can tell you that I've had to use it twice in my ownership of these eras of Mopars. Very easy to swap out and then you're back on your way. By the way, the failure mode for ballast resistors is that the car will start, but it'll instantly die. It's not that it won't start, but it fires, and then all of a sudden it just is like you shut the key off the second that it fires. And finally, while 1973 was the last year for the fuselage era Imperial, it did increase in sales a bit year over year. Sales totaled 16,729 units. That was comprised of 14,000 sedans and 2,500 coupes. It was up versus about 15,800 units in 1972. But as you can tell from the sales figures I just quoted, Imperial was really not selling many units when you compare it to Cadillac that was selling in the hundreds of thousands of units, or even Lincoln, who was selling, by this point, almost 50,000-plus Mark IVs alone in their lineup. So Imperial was not much of a success, and I think there were a number of reasons for that. The price point was relatively high, but also these vehicles didn't have great residual value and as a consequence, if you're a luxury buyer, what's one of the key things that you want in your vehicle? You want it to maintain its value. These Imperials had the lowest residual value of that Cadillac Lincoln Imperial Trio. Chrysler also didn't have a great reputation for quality at this point, And perhaps the styling was a bit polarizing as well on these vehicles. But for whatever reason, they didn't sell all that well. And Chrysler would bring out a new Imperial for 1974. But that next Imperial would be short-lived and it would soon die off leaving the Imperial dead until it was revived again for the 1981 to 83 model years. Hope you enjoyed this spotlight on the 1973 Imperial. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.